Good morning everyone, welcome to week number 11. Now this is week 11 that means we are approaching the end of this course and this is the penultimate topic that we have to discuss here. Over last 3 topics we had quite intense discussion over 3 parameters or measurement of 3 parameters which are very common to our day to day application, industrial applications, even layman also needs to have uh, knowledge about the values of these parameters namely pressure, flow and temperature where we have discussed uh, in detail about different possible types of measurement that we can have and uh, accordingly uh, different categories of instruments we have talked about particularly the ones which are most common. Uh, now in this week we are going to talk about the motion measurement uh, because of the intense nature of the discussion in the previous weeks and also considering that we are approaching the end of the course. So, this week and also in the coming week I shall be keeping the discussions quite short and brief talking only about the most important points or touching upon only the most uh, relevant points related to the measurement of motion in this week and certain special topics in the next week instead of going into too much detail of the uh, relevant measurement systems. Now the term motion here I have to clarify at the beginning itself. Here we are definitely referring to some kind of velocity or acceleration measurement, but that does not relate to any kind of flow situation. Because the measurement of flow velocity or fluid velocity in a flow we have already discussed in the concerned week or during the concerned module. Uh, if you remember there we have talked about Peter tube. Now Peter tube though it is actually a pressure measurement instrument or it actually senses pressure but using pitot tube or to be more specific using the static pitot tube we can actually get a direct measurement of the fluid velocity and uh, that is the most common type of flow velocity measurement option that we can get. Similarly we have talked about anemometers or mass flow meters where uh, we definitely get the mass flow measurement but if we have idea about the density of the flow or density of the fluid which is flowing and also the cross section area of the duct we can uh, calibrate the same directly in terms of fluid velocity. Also we have talked about very enhanced measurement systems like uh, LDV laser Doppler velocimeter or PIV particle image velocimeter or velocimetry both of which gives you a direct representation of the velocity vectors in a particular 3 dimensional flow field. So the measurement of fluid velocity we have already covered both simple and complicated type of instruments. Similarly uh, we are also not going to talk about the flow of or I should say the velocity of any rigid body motion. Like when a rigid body or particle is moving somewhere, uh, the measurement of its velocity is primarily related to the displacement measurement. Because once you know the displacement with respect to time, you can easily get velocity from there. Like in one of the earlier weeks in week number 4, we have discussed about uh, the circuits or data processing circuits like differentiators and integrators. And from that knowledge you know that once we have uh, suppose the measurement of displacement in form of an uh, electric signal then we can easy, easily use a differential amplifier or I am wrong differentiating amplifier I should say we can easily use a differentiating amplifier or just a differentiator which will actually give you the derivative of the input quantity that is the derivative of the displacement which is nothing but velocity. So such particle velocity also can directly be measured using those instruments. Here our discussion will mostly be revolving around vibration picking up vibration and measuring the magnitude of corresponding vibration velocities or velocity of the platform which is vibrating and corresponding acceleration. So the term mechanical motion generally can have uh, several kinds of applications means just the way you would like to visualize this accordingly all of them can come under this mechanical motion. But before I move forward I have to clarify between two terms which are uh, sometimes used quite uh, interchangeably one is vibration other is shock. Vibration basically refer refers to a motion which has some kind of repetitive nature. The amplitude may be changing but uh, it should be some kind of uh, repetition of uh, over this entire there, sh or there should be some kind of repetitive structure repetitive nature over the entire span of discussion. The like uh, say if a system is uh, forced to vibrate you may see an waveform like this with the amplitude continuously decaying finally going back to the stable situation but the repetitive nature is there which may not be the case in case of a shock. In case of shock you may get a 
uh, sudden disturbance in the flow stream and then uh, it decays quickly to go back to the original situation which is not truly the case in case of vibration. In case of vibration if there is uh, not sufficient damping provided then you will get a continuous waveform moving with continuously with the same amplitude and frequency over infinite period of time which is not the case in case of a shock. So, we are going to primarily focus on this kind of nature where we can have a periodic movement over a long period of time which is we are calling as vibration. Now, as I mentioned mechanical motion can have different types of description. So, all these uh, four can come under mechanical motion which I am going to talk about. Like if I say displacement then we know that suppose uh, in a linear motion displacement generally we represent as s which can be a function of time depending upon the system that you are dealing with. Similarly, in case of an angular system or angular coordinate system if you have to deal with then we commonly use the symbol theta to represent this. So, this displacement definitely is a kind of motion that you have to deal with, but quite often history of displacement we talk in terms of velocity. Velocity v is nothing but the differential form of displacement whereas, in case of angular coordinate system we generally use the symbol omega to represent the angular velocity. This mechanical motion can also relate acceleration. Acceleration A is again nothing but dv dt or we can write the second derivative of displacement. Similarly, uh, if alpha is a symbol that we use to represent angular acceleration, this is just d omega dt or d 2 theta d t 2. So, whenever you are talking about the measurement of mechanical motion, we may be talking about measurement of any one of the three displacement, velocity or acceleration or may be more than one means uh, your system may be simultaneously giving a measurement of both displacement and velocity. But there is a fourth one also which we may need under certain situation which is called jerk. Jerk is the rate of change of acceleration in both linear and angular coordinate system which you are dealing with. So, sometimes in certain situations we may also have to deal with a jerk particularly when designing mechanical or structures or large civil structures. So, your mechanical motion related discussion can involve any one of the four measurement of any one of the four or more than one. But in this particular week we are focusing primarily on measuring the velocity and acceleration associated with a vibrating member. And for that purpose we can uh, use two kinds of instruments one is vibrometer other is accelerometer. Vibrometer uh, actually is the one which relates to the measurement of velocity, accelerometer is the one which relates to the measurement of acceleration. Uh, truly speaking a vibration pickup or vibrometer and an accelerometer has nothing different in terms of their working principle. Their major difference will be coming in terms of the secondary transducer that uh, we shall be using to get the final output. Like uh, generally all these devices have two transducers in sequence. This is the primary one and this is the secondary one. Primary one we uh, invariably will take the input and convert this one to some kind of electrical output which is going to the secondary one. Now, depending upon the nature of the secondary one the same device may act as a vibrometer or I should say the same primary transducer may act as vibrometer or accelerometer. Like suppose uh, you have already studied about displacement measurement. So, if I relate to that if your secondary transducer is a potentiometer or if your secondary transducer is an LVDT then the output that you are going to get that is uh, uh, that is velocity. So, if this secondary transducer is a potentiometer or, or a linear variable differential transformer, then you are going to get velocity as the output. However, if this secondary transducer is a variable reluctance type like something like an inductosin. then what you are going to get that is 
acceleration. So, by changing the secondary transducer, so the same primary transducer can be used to act either as a vibrometer or an accelerometer or uh, I should say um, this may not be the perfect description. Let me be consistent with our earlier discussion. Let us say the potentiometer and LVDT if you are using the secondary transducer you are going to get displacement and then this displacement using because uh, potentiometer the true output is displacement and generally this secondary transducer is connected with a differentiating transducer or differentiating amplifier or a differentiator. So, we get velocity as a final output. So, truly speaking your secondary transducer is going to get displacement which will subsequently be converted to velocity using the differentiator. Whereas, if you are using an inductosine you are going to get velocity and that will be scaled or uh, differentiated to get acceleration. Whereas, we can have separate accelerometers also where uh, the output is directly acceleration and we do not have to bother about the nature of the secondary transducer. Now, elementary vibration detectors we can talk about two different kinds of instruments or uh, techniques I should say which uh, can give you a uh, very elemental identification whether there is vibration present in a system or not. But before I mention about any technique the I should say the most uh, common or most efficient vibration sensor that we have is nothing but our skin or our touch our sense of touch. Uh, human touch can sense vibration amplitude as low as 0 0.3 micron. This is just by touching something like if this particular pen is vibrating and if I touch it very loosely even a vibration of the amplitude 0 0.03 micron can be sensed properly. Whereas, on the other hand if I grip it tightly uh, it uh, further we it is a much stronger grip in that case the amplitude vibration that we can pick up can be even smaller something in the range of 0 0.025 micron that is at least one order smaller than this. And uh, no instrument that we have at present can uh, sense vibration efficiently with this level of amplitude. So, human touch is probably the most efficient way of sensing vibration, but uh, practically we need some kind of options to measure or quantify vibration and uh, therefore, there are several common kinds of instruments we can have. The vibrating wedge is nothing but a triangular shaped wedge something like this which is uh, mounted on one surface and this particular surface when it comes in contact with any vibrating member this particular surface then this wedge keeps on vibrating and as the wedge keeps on vibrating its position keeps on changing continuously. So, let us say at uh, as the wedge keeps on vibrating over a range then let us say this is the uh, extreme position of this topmost edge the highest position this topmost edge of wedge can have and this is the lowest position. Then if it is vibrating uh, quickly uh, let me draw the lowest position of this wedge as well. So, this is the wedge when it is at the lowest possible position. is fine. So, what is the distance between these two peaks? This is the one what this one signifies this is definitely amplitude of the vibration. So, if we measure this one the then we can or measure or get an idea about these two extreme positions or maybe get a photograph of this then we can directly get uh, the peak to peak amplitude for this. Here of course, the direction of motion is this much. So, this mechanical wedge or vibrating wedge is a very simple way of uh, giving you the uh, direction of motion and also an idea about the peak to peak amplitude. However, we are not going to get the waveform from this and also not too much idea about the frequency of these oscillations because uh, it is not possible to count the number of uh, oscillations this wedge is having over a given period of time. So, the most common method of measuring frequency can be a cantilever beam, can be the use of a cantilever beam or a cantilever beam of variable length. Suppose, this is the member which is undergoing certain kind of vibration, then what we are going to do is that we are going to get this cantilever beam in contact with this particular body and then using some suitable technique we are going to change this length. Now, the beam itself has some natural frequency 
and as the length changes its natural frequency is going to change. Now, if we keeps on changing this length slowly then we may reach a point where the natural frequency of the beam and the frequency of vibration of uh, this uh, platform this member they becomes equal to each other. So, then there will be resonance happening and the beam will start to oscillate with very large amplitude. So, we can uh, get an idea about the frequency of uh, the beam from corresponding to that uh, natural sorry frequency of the member the object corresponding to the natural frequency of the beam with that particular length when you have very large amplitude oscillations. So, these are very simple way of measuring or detecting vibration, but the most common way of doing this is use the use of seismic transducers. A seismic transducer is nothing but a spring mass damper system. Here we have a large mass generally called a seismic mass given by m, the, uh, there is a spring let us say the spring is having a constant k and we are also having a damper let us say the zeta is the damping coefficient. So, this entire assembly is uh, how in located inside a house and we are having this work piece which is the one that is undergoing oscillations. So, from this particular assembly we can easily get uh, an idea about the vibration or the entire uh, nature of vibration the amplitude its oscillation frequency and also the nature of the waveform using a simple arrangement like seismic transducer. Depending upon the configuration of transducer it can be used as vibrometer or accelerometer like if you are looking for velocity measurement then uh, it will work in a displacement mode when we need to have a large value of m and a soft spring. Whereas, if we are looking for acceleration measurement then the mass should be smaller and the spring should be much stiffer for this but uh, working, uh, working principle remains very much the same. Let us quickly check the working principle. Let us say this is our mass m and we are drawing a free body diagram. Then under certain situations what are the forces acting on this? Let us say this direction indicates x. So, under a certain situation uh, the spring force is acting there or if I say this is the spring force, it is also the damping force can also be there. Of course, the direction of both the forces will depend upon the direction of motion and uh, there will be an inertia force also. This inertia force is the one that is opposing the motion of this against the vibration. So, under equilibrium condition the summation of all these three forces has to be equal to 0. Now, what are the magnitude of these forces? The spring force if uh, x is the amount of displacement the body is having then the spring force will be equal to k into x. What about the damping force? The damping force will be the damping coefficient into velocity that is we can write uh, damping force into dx dt. Now, instead of uh, writing s let us say x is equal to s m which refers to displacement of the mass then let us replace this x with S m, S m refers to the displacement of the mass and what about the inertia force for this mass? The inertia force for this mass will be equal to m into its acceleration that is we can write m into the second derivative of the displacement. So, if we put all of them together then what we are going to get? putting all of them together we have f i inertia force plus the damping force or viscous force plus the spring force is equal to 0 that is the inertia force m into d 2 s m d t 2 plus d s m d t plus k s m is equal to 0. This is very much the equation of a second order system, but uh, S m is the displacement of this mass m, but we are not interested to know the displacement of this mass m rather we are interested to know the displacement of the member which is having this displacement like if we go back to the previous slide this is the mass m that we are talking about, but our interest is about this work piece. So, let us say S m refers to 
the displacement of the work piece. Then let us say S, uh, S refers to the displacement of the subject or of our object because SM already we have used. Then uh, if SR indicates the relative displacement between the two, then what will be SR relative displacement of the mass with respect to object? Then SR will be equal to SM minus SS or SM will be equal to SR plus SS. So, if you take this here. S m is getting replaced by S r plus S s. S r plus S s k into S r plus S s is equal to 0. Now, the member is not at all affected by the spring or the damping force or the subject and accordingly our equation gets modified to SR DT2 DSR DT plus KSR is equal to minus of M D2 SS DT2. Now, let us assume something. Let us assume that the member is undergoing a simple harmonic motion. Of course, simple harmonic motion is uh, not possible in practical situations and uh, so the one final value or expression that we are going to get that will be application of that will be quite limited. Still, um, that can give you some important insight into what is going to happen. It is quite similar to the way we have analyzed the uh, generalized second order measuring instrument in the second week during the second module. Uh, but uh, as that was uh, quite a few time, month, weeks back or a couple of months back at least. So, I am doing the exercise again and also to show you the relation between this member displacement or object displacement with the mass displacement. So, we are assuming that this mass or object S S is undergoing a simple harmonic motion of the form uh, say S S O into cos omega t, where omega is the frequency of oscillation and S S O is the amplitude. So, if we put it back here or before putting back here if we differentiate this. So, it will become minus S S O omega sin omega t and if we differentiate it once more minus S S O omega square sin omega t. So, putting it back here we are having this as m into s s o omega square cos omega t. So, this is a uh, second order system that we are dealing with a very much a second order system and we have to get a solution for this when it is subjected to this kind of simple harmonic motion. We could have also chosen uh, instead of choosing this particular waveform we could have also chosen a step input or something like this, but as we are talking about vibration. So, the simple harmonic motion is the most idealized input that we can have for a system. Now, the solution for this one is quite standard and uh, I am sure you already know the solution for this particular system. Uh, to simplify this, let us divide this entire equation by capital M so that we have D2 SR DT2 plus IM SR DT plus K upon M S R is equal to S S O zeta square cos omega t. So, uh, it is a very standard second order uh, OD which uh, we can solve using any standard boundary condition, but before uh, if we from there we can easily write that the standard from F S R T will contain two parts, one exponential part and another uh, transient part which is of importance generally where the exponential part will be having some constant. I am not writing the detailed expression you can go back to week number 2 or can refer to any standard textbooks where it will be having minus t upon tau where tau is the time constant and in this particular case your time constant will be equal to twice of m upon zeta. 
and the one that is of major importance to us is the second part. In the second part, we are having m s s o omega square upon k into cos of omega t plus phi, where phi refers to the phase angle divided by root over 1 minus omega whole square, this whole square plus 4 sorry plus it will be equal to 2 zeta by omega whole square. Here this omega refers to the natural frequency, we can also write this one to be omega n just to clarify that we are talking about the natural frequency and omega m, uh, can you identify the omega n from this equation, this uh, particular equation that we have written from there. It is very simple, it will be root over a naught by a 2. So, from there it becomes root over k by m and uh, so if we are talking about when t tends to infinity or t is a large time, this exponential term fall drops out and we are left with s r t to be equal to some s r 0 into cos omega t. Uh, this omega is wrong, this should have been the capital omega which is the frequency of the um, vibrating member omega t plus phi. Here s r 0 is the amplitude of oscillation of this relative displacement. So, this is equal to m by k we can represent as uh, or k by m can be written as omega n square. So, this becomes s s o into capital omega by omega n whole square into 1 minus omega upon omega n whole square plus 2 zeta omega upon omega n whole square whole to the power minus half. And this phi is the phase difference that is uh, going to get introduced because of the action or presence of all this mass and damper and the spring and so it will be equal to tan inverse of 2 zeta omega n divided by 1 minus whole square. Here of course this zeta is the ratio of the critical the damping coefficient to the critical damping coefficient that you may have the system. Truly speaking I should have made another change also where uh, this term should have been and also here there should have been zeta only this ratio this. So, this is a very standard mathematical practice to get the waveform for this corresponding to the relative displacement. Now, we have the amplitude of this one and frequency for this one, but you have to consider that here you are talking about when you have progressed a bit in time so that the exponential part has dropped out and we are left with only this so called uh, near steady state or stabilized part of the displacement. Now, uh, here there are several points to look for uh, like look at the expression for this SRO. Now, here the natural frequency and the value of this zeta, they are all or they are both can be altered at the design level of the seismic instrument itself. So, uh, omega n and uh, zeta are given, then everything for comes to the value of this capital omega that you are introducing or in a way the ratio of omega upon omega n, everything becomes dependent on this frequency ratio. Uh, ratio of angular frequency or just uh, normal frequency, everything comes dependent on that for both amplitude and phase response. Now, we have earlier studied the standard amplitude and phase response for uh, instruments 
uh, for second order instruments more a repetition of the same thing. You can see as the frequency ratio keeps on increasing the magnitude or the amplitude you can say this one can be viewed to be a representation of S R O divided by S S O. Actually, I should have uh, given a plot of S R O S S O directly. Uh, if I represent that in this way, say S R O by S S O and divide here omega upon omega n separately, then you will find that for small value of zeta, you may have a profile somewhat like this, or it should not be such sharp line. But as zeta keeps on reducing, it becomes uh, more moderate. This for very high value of zeta, it is just trying to approach this, and this particular level is one. So interesting part is as the omega keeps on increasing, frequency keeps on increasing. Typically, when omega capital omega is about three times for this, then everything is quite close to one, and um, so that is something quite desirable. And these are the zeta values, zeta keeps on in, uh, increasing in this direction. So, we have to choose the damping also uh, accordingly because damping has a critical role to play. Similarly, the phase difference for frequency ratio omega upon omega n equal to 1, we are having a 90 degree phase difference between the two and uh, this ratio of uh, these two frequencies, this particular thing has to be taken into consideration. Like we can check one numerical example. Suppose uh, let us say for a certain situation for a uh, certain system seismic instrument, we have zeta given to be equal to 0 0.68 and uh, it is given that the amplitude of this is SO is something like 0 0.015 millimeter extremely small oscillations it is having. The natural frequency has been measured to be 4.75 hertz whereas the excitation frequency is given as 7 hertz. Now, we have to estimate how much error may get introduced if we directly take this SRO to be equal to SSO. Uh, we have for that we need to because this is the actual amplitude oscillation that is happening, happening but your SRO is slightly different. So, now what is the frequency ratio here? Here F E upon F N can be taken to be equal to using suitable conversion factor you can we take this one as omega upon omega n is equal to 4.75 by 7. I have pre-calculated a number to be 1.474. So, if we calculate now S R O using the expression provided in the previous slide. So, we have uh, S S O into omega n whole square divided by root over just referring back to the previous slide look at this expression. So, we have uh, this thing root over 1 minus omega upon omega in whole square this entire thing to be whole square plus 2 zeta upon omega n again this entire thing to be equal whole square and if we put this number you are going to get this R to be equal to 0 0.014 something like this. So, how much error that gets introduced? So, percentage error if we take this one to be the correct reading instead of taking this one then the percentage error that is getting introduced is mod of 0 0.015 minus 0 0.014 divided by the true one that is 0 0.015 into 100 percent this will roughly be coming around 6.3 percent approximately. So, about 6 percent error gets introduced because uh, we are taking the amplitude of this relative displacement to be equal to the amplitude of the true member displacement. But if we have proper idea about this uh, particular omega upon omega n then we can easily do this correction to get the uh, final value properly means we can easily use this value of SRO to get the value of SSO. So, this is the mathematical base for any seismic instrument. Uh, as I have promised this lectures I shall be keeping quite short and that is why today I am going to finish it here itself. And in the next lecture I shall be discussing slightly more about a few other vibration related instruments. 
So, we today talked about different kinds of mechanical motion, we have seen the displacement, velocity, acceleration and jerk all comes under this category of mechanical motion. Then we have talked about vibrometers and accelerometers where difference is mostly in terms of the secondary transducer that is used. Like with the same primary transducer if we use an LVDT that will act as a vibrometer giving a displacement and subsequently getting converted to velocity whereas if you are using an inductive scene we can get velocity which can be converted to acceleration. Then we have talked about the elementary detector in two forms the simple wedge which generally gives the amplitude of oscillation but not frequency uh, to get the frequency we can use a simple cantilever beam of uh, mod changing length and then uh, very basic um, discussion about seismic transducer we had today where we mostly focus on mathematics. Uh, uh, most part was a repetition of what we discussed earlier about the response of a second order transducer against simple harmonic inputs. So, that is it for the day. I would uh, like to discuss a bit more on this in the next lecture. Till then, goodbye.